Okay, this is uh, vitamins and minerals. So vitamins are essential organic substances needed in small amounts in the diet for normal function, growth, and maintenance of the body. Um, again, that's a fairly fluffy definition, and um, we'll kind of look at some of those vitamins that I've selected to be pretty important for our athletes, and we'll take a look at their um, function specifically. But we know that our vitamins can be either fat-soluble or water-soluble. This has to do with um, how they're going to be transported. So our water-soluble vitamins will be transported in, in water, whereas fat-soluble vitamins will be um, carried and stored with fat. So again, um, like previously mentioned, fat-soluble vitamins are not excreted from the body, um, with the exception of vitamin K, whereas water-soluble vitamins can be lost from the body quite rapidly. So those can be flushed out of our systems pretty easily, so it's important for us to make sure we're getting those water-soluble vitamins uh, daily. Vitamin deficiency occurs when a vitamin is lacking in the diet and the body's stores are exhausted. So again, um, that's probably a little bit more pertinent for those water-soluble vitamins, although it certainly can happen with the fat-soluble vitamins as well. So vitamin A, um, some of its functions um, are not completely understood, although we know that it is an important um, component of vision. And foods that are high in vitamin A, a lot of orange foods. So again, you can see sweet potatoes down here, papaya, carrots, peaches, apricots, um, peppers um, are all good, good sources of vitamin A. Um, I will point out a few vitamins that are or a few food items that are going to be high in a lot of vitamins. One of them is peppers uh, and broccoli are both going to be um, pretty good sources of a lot of different vitamins, so kind of keep your eyes peeled for those. Vitamin D is known as the sunshine vitamin. Um, this helps to regulate calcium and bone metabolism and bone density. And the sunshine vitamin can be made endogenously. So endogenously means we can create it within ourselves. And with sun exposure, um, this generally provides about 90% of our vitamin D um, need, basically. So um, as long as you're in the sun 15 minutes, two to three times a week, this will provide you um, with the sunshine needed to endogenously create vitamin D. Um, we can also get it in our diets. Um, some dietary sources include milk, eggs, and fish. Vitamin E is an important component of our cell membrane, and it also um, serves as an antioxidant. And again, that's kind of a buzzword um, <clears throat> today. But basically, an antioxidant is a substance that inhibits or prevents cell damage. So it's going to kind of fight off free radicals, which are a um, byproduct of oxidative metabolism. So our antioxidants are going to kind of help combat that. And so um, we're going to create a large amount of free radicals with a lot of oxidative stress. Um, some foods where we'll see vitamin E, again, you can see peppers made the, the cut here. Um, also almonds, apricots, etc. <clears throat> so a little bit more information about the antioxidants. So again, antioxidants are our body's primary defense against free radicals. Uh, free radicals are produced as a result of our normal aerobic metabolism. So again, they're only produced as they are associated with oxidative um, pathways. And the kind of issue with them is they can cause damage to cell membranes and DNA structures. For sedentary people, the effect of antioxidant supplementation is unclear, um, although we're going to have a look at the effect of antioxidants with our athletes here on the next slide. So kind of as we mentioned, um, these free radicals are produced as um, a byproduct of oxidative metabolism. And so as we do aerobic exercise, this will increase the free radical production. And so <clears throat> there's been some question as to whether endurance athletes need more antioxidants in order to um, kind of combat these free radicals. And it seems as though we've got some mixed reviews in terms of um, responses associated with this. So endurance athletes, it seems they can upregulate the antioxidants that they have. So um, the antioxidants that endurance athletes have might be more effective at fighting off 
um, this additional amount of free radicals in comparison to that of an untrained person. Um, so it, it doesn't, we don't have clear, we don't have a clear answer if athlete supplementation of antioxidants has a benefit. Um, so there's no clear benefits. Again, we've had some mixed reviews. Some researchers have found them to be helpful um, for our endurance athletes, whereas others have not found them to enhance our performance. I guess take home messages, no one has found them to be harmful. Um, so, you know, uh, consuming extra antioxidants is certainly not going to hurt an endurance athlete, particularly because we're going to find them in um, items like blueberries and, and some other healthy options. So it's certainly never going to hurt us to include those things in our diets. Although um, we're not sure if it has a clear performance enhancing capacity. So again, um, exercise increases the force production of free radicals. Oxidative stress causes fatigue and muscle damage. Um, mixed results in terms of the findings. So um, a reduction in muscle damage. Some have found no difference. Some have actually found worse, outcome, worse outcomes um, or more inflammation as a result of antioxidant supplementation. Um, certainly more research needs to be done in this area. If you're choosing antioxidants from natural food sources, we have not found anything um, linked to a decrease in performance with that. So um, again, just something to think about. And um, when if you are thinking about you know trying a new supplement, I think it's super important to kind of um, look into the literature and see what, what we've found in relation to health and also, you know, is it actually going to be an effective um, supplement for you. So this just shows you some of the natural sources of antioxidants um, that you could choose. So cocoa powder, well, let's have a hot chocolate or something. Um, blueberries is also a great source. Um, several other fruits, cranberries, apples, you can see here, um, pears, plums, pomegranates. So again, um, quite a few different types of fruits. Also cinnamon um, and artichokes and pecans are also on the list. <clears throat> Moving on to vitamin K. Um, this is an important Vitamin for blood clotting also plays a role in forming proteins present in bone, muscle, and kidney. Again, you can see peppers made the list here, and broccoli is also on the list. Vitamin B1 plays an important role in carbohydrate digestion and metabolism. Again, we talked about the B vitamins um, being important for metabolism. Again, they're going to help us to release energy, although they don't actually provide us with energy themselves. Um, foods containing uh, vitamin B1 include beans, grains, and red meats. Again, this picture is a little bit blurry, but um, you can see the beans and then uh, the red meat. <clears throat> Riboflavin or um, B2 serves as a coenzyme in, in many metabolic pathways. And again, if you remember back to lecture two, a coenzyme is kind of like a coach or the manager of a factory. He's going to help to uh, speed things up, but doesn't actually change anything within the reaction. Um, so vitamin B12 um, would certainly enhance our metabolism through this uh, mechanism. And some places we're going to find B2, cereal, nuts, milk, eggs, leafy vegetables, and lean meat. <clears throat> B3 is also a coenzyme in many cellular pathways. Um, foods include dairy, uh, poultry, nuts, eggs, etc. So again, um, basically all the B vitamins are going to be important for um, enhancing metabolic pathways, which is going to help us to release energy. Um, so kind of just what I, just to reiterate that, so we've got B5, B6, and B7 here. Um, you can see some examples of, of where we'll find these things. And again, um, they're going to help us to release energy from all of our macronutrients, um, which is why we find the B-complex vitamins in a lot of energy beverages. B9 is an important component of uh, DNA. Um, again, you can see some of the same culprits as we've seen in some of the other vitamins. So dark leafy greens, um, you know, poultry, whole grains, dark greens, beans, those types of things, citrus fruits. Um, B12 is an important vitamin 
protection for DNA synthesis as well. It also helps to maintain our myelin sheaths that insulate neurons, so it helps with our neurological function. Uh, B12 is only found in animal products, so it's only found in meat, eggs, and milk. Um, although many cereals are fortified with B12, which would help um, help our vegetarians or vegans um, meet this meet this uh, guideline as well. So that is probably the most important vitamin for vegetarians or vegans to um, be on the lookout for is B12 because it's not going to naturally be found in any of the products that they're consuming unless they are consuming eggs and milk and or milk. Vitamin C is going to help, help us to synthesize the protein collagen, and collagen is an important component of uh, connective tissue. It's um, found in the bone, teeth, skin, tendons, and blood vessels. So uh, collagen is a protein that gives things like a tensile strength, basically. So the collagen found in your skin helps to keep your skin tight. So as you age and your skin gets like wrinkly, um, it gets wrinkly because these collagen fibers get like basically worn out or stretched out. Um, but collagen is what makes our tendons and ligaments um, and those types of things like pretty sturdy. They have a lot more collagen in them in comparison to like the skin, for example. Um, so vitamin C is going to help us to maintain the strength of uh, the collagen. So here you can see a look, um, if we were to look under a microscope at some connective tissue, you can see the collagen fibers are kind of those um, like more maroonish fibers. And again, they're a lot thicker in comparison to the elastic fibers. And again, the collagen fibers are going to give a tissue its strength, whereas the elastic fibers or the elastin fibers are going to give the tissue a stretchy um, texture. Foods high in vitamin C, um, all your citrus fruits, and again, peppers made the cut and broccoli made the cut. So if you were on a test and you were not sure about a vitamin that, or a food that was high in a particular vitamin, I think peppers or broccoli would be a really good guess. So here's a question for you to kind of think about. Um, is vitamin supplementation beneficial for athletes? Um, you know, I think some would debate that, yes, it is It is beneficial. It helps our athletes to kind of cover all their bases. Um, but I would also, you know, make the argument that our athletes should be really trying to focus on getting the vitamins and minerals they need from natural sources. So um, a supplement is meant to supplement the diet. It shouldn't take the place of a healthy diet, but it certainly won't harm an athlete. Um, so it is something to think about. And I... Um, probably a decision on the individual level. But again, I think that we should encourage all athletes to try and get all the vitamins and minerals they need from their natural sources first. It's a supplement to kind of make up for any deficiencies that uh, they might have. All right, so moving on to minerals. Let's take a look at some of the major minerals. So um, in terms of the general role of minerals. Um, metabolic roles are going to vary substantially. Um, some minerals are going to serve as cofactors, so again they're going to assist in causing a reaction to occur, um, although they're not actually going to change or modify uh, based on that particular reaction. So again they're like a coach that's going to help speed things up. Um, they're going to contribute to body compounds such as iron. So iron would contribute to our body compound. Again, iron will um, play an important role in creating our red blood cells. And then also body growth and development, um, such as calcium and phosphorus, are going to play an important role in the growth and development of our bones. Minerals are excreted in the following ways. They're excreted, excreted in our urine our sweat, and also our feces. So again, our, your, our sweat is probably the most variant, um, depending on, you know, how much excess you have. We can talk about mineral <clears throat> bioavailability. Um, although minerals may be present in food, they're not bioavailable unless the, food, the body can absorb them. 
So bioavailability is affected by the form in which they are consumed. So animal products are going to have a higher bioavailability in comparison to plant products for some reason. Um, it has to do with the breakdown process and um, how we couple absorption of um, proteins and uh, saturated fats and, and things like that. Um, plant products are going to contain fiber, which actually hinders mineral absorption. Um, so again, remember that fiber is a molecule that looks very similar to a carbohydrate, uh, like a long chain of carbohydrates, and we're not actually able to um, break that down or digest it. And so as a result, um, this is going to hinder our ability to actually absorb some of the minerals um, in that food substance. Um, sodium is going to aid in our neural system. So sodium is an important component of, of the nervous system and allows us to um, send signals through the nervous system. Also an important component of water balance. Again, um, sodium likes to move with water. So if we can get sodium to move in one direction, water will also follow. Um, so therefore we can manipulate sodium movement and that's going to affect our water balance. Uh, the bioavailability of sodium is, is basically 100, so we can absorb sodium super easy, and we overconsume it um, in addition to that, so um, we're pretty much never at a shortage for sodium. Toxicity or consuming too much sodium could um, contribute to hypertension or high blood pressure. Deficiency of sodium may lead to muscle cramps and dehydration. Um, again, this would be very uncommon with sedentary people, um, but may be a risk for, um, for our athletes. And under what conditions? Probably in hot conditions um, where you're losing a lot of fluids. Um, drinking just plain water in high quantities would also put us at risk for um, a sodium deficiency as well. So again, in hot conditions where an athlete is um, sweating a lot, we would recommend that they have something with electrolytes so they are getting some of those sodium uh, molecules replaced. Uh, potassium is going to also be an important component of our, neural, our nervous system and also helps with water balance as well. Um, so it's going to allow us to send neural signals and also um, keep our water levels balanced. High, level, high levels are also associated with hypertension when combined with high levels of, of um, sodium. There are no major risks for deficiency, although um, it is possible that potassium deficiency could lead to cramping in our athletes. Foods that are high in potassium, again, um, I was always taught when I was younger in high school and, and before then, um, if you get muscle cramps to eat a banana, and that would be true. I mean, bananas are going to be high in potassium, so that's a great, great source there. Um, cauliflower is another. Um, there you can see a good breakfast in the middle where you've got oatmeal and bananas and uh, orange juice, and all those are going to be high in potassium as well. Calcium is going to be an important uh, mineral for our bone structure, tooth strength, and then also muscle contractions. Again, you can see some dark leafy greens here and broccoli made the cut and certainly dairy products are going to be high in calcium as well. Lots of females are not meeting the recommendation for calcium intake. 75% um, female athletes most likely to be affected include dancers, gymnasts, and endurance competitors. Again, the same athletes that are going to be at a high risk for eating disorders and are maybe just lower on the calorie intake side of things. Um, so again, uh, keeping our eyes on, on these types of issues for our ladies put us at a higher risk for stress fractures um, and osteoporosis later in life as well. So both exercise and calcium supplementation can help to prevent the issue of uh, low bone density. Muscle cramps might be due to loss of calcium. Uh, muscle cramps are are tough. We don't actually have a really good understanding of what causes them. Again, it could be dehydration, it could be calcium, it could be sodium. Not a lot, not a lot um, completely understood out there about that. There's a little, very little research on performance enhancing effect of calcium supplementation. Um, it seems as though like if you are deficient in calcium, then taking supplementation of calcium will enhance your performance. Um, but if you're already at the normal levels, um, then it's not really going to make much of a difference. Um, its impact on the bone is what's most important. Again, particularly for our ladies, we want to maintain that bone density so that we can prevent osteoporosis 
later in life. <clears throat> and iron uh, is a functional component of hemoglobin, which we know makes up the red blood cells. And our red blood cells job is to carry oxygen. So if we're deficient in iron, we're not able to carry as much oxygen, which means we're going to feel tired because we're not able to produce energy or convert energy as quickly through the oxidative system. Um, Iron is also going to be an important component of our immune function. Um, found in lots of different meats and also cereals as well. Dark leafy greens would be a good vegetable source of iron as well. Iron deficiency, uh, known as anemia, common in vegetarians, also common in our female athletes. Um, this doesn't mean that iron supplementation is, is needed for all athletes. Um, it's certainly pretty easy to get a blood test and um, get your iron tested to determine whether you're someone who would need iron supplementation. Uh, we actually have the capacity to do this here at Loris. Um, I've got a, a monitor so we could um, test your iron levels if, if that's something that you would be concerned with. Um, and again, it's not necessary for all athletes to supplement with iron, um, but you know, if you are one of those people that has lower levels, um, supplementation is, is certainly a great idea. Phosphorus is required for our bone and tooth strength. Strength also helps with <coughs> acid-base balance. It's actually found in soda, which is kind of interesting. Um, also found in dairy products, fish, and nuts as well. This is going to form like the backbone of our um, <coughs> of our bones. This is kind of interesting. This is known as the Andy scale or the aggregate nutrient density index. And basically what this does is it like ranks foods based on their um, calorie value in comparison to their vitamin and mineral value. Um, and this is why every time I do this unit, I think like, oh, I've got to get kale because it's so good for you. Again, you can see kale as number one on the list there. It's got a score of a thousand, which a high score means that you're getting a lot of nutrients in comparison to calorie. Um, so again, kale is like awesome. It's chocked full of all sorts of nutrients and things. Again, if you look kind of on that left column, a lot of those things are dark leafy greens, um, green peppers over there as well, asparagus. Um, tomatoes, blueberries also on that side of things. Um, and then as you move over on the right side, um, you can see, you know, the change in some of these nutrients. This is nothing that I want you to memorize. I just thought it was kind of interesting. Um, if we could try and maximize the amount of calories we're getting from some of those things on the left side, um, that would certainly be to our benefit. Um, I'm not a salesperson for eggs or anything else, but um, if you're looking for a way to get a lot of vitamins and minerals in a cheap way, I know as college students a lot of times we are pretty concerned with cost, eggs are a great way. Um, eggs are pretty chock full of nutrients and they're cheap to buy. Um, so I just, I don't know, I like to show this as a good way for you to get a variety of vitamins and minerals um, in eggs. Um, just another look at the Andy scale. These are your top 20 foods. Again, kale is number one. Um, again, I encourage you to try and maximize uh, your calorie consumption with incorporating some of these. So try and, you know, if you don't normally eat broccoli, maybe try and make something with broccoli. Or if you don't normally eat strawberries, like, hey, maybe this is the week where you do get strawberries and you put those, you know, in a smoothie or, or whatever. Um, so again, you can see a lot of dark leafy greens in here and a variety of other fruits and, I, and uh, a couple other veggies too. So I encourage you to try and incorporate these into your diet because again, you're really maximizing your vitamin and mineral um, intake uh, with these items. Uh, minerals and athletes. So despite the important roles minerals play in the body, um, small daily requirements are generally met by the typical American diet. So again, that's if you're eating a balanced diet. I did read all of your nutritional diaries and a lot of you didn't have a single fruit or didn't have a single vegetable in the whole day. Um, so again, we are meeting these requirements if you're eating a balanced diet. Um, mineral supplementation in excess is not recommended. It doesn't seem to have an ergogenic effect 
on athletic performance. So um, you're basically just wasting your money if if you are, you know, taking a supplement above and beyond what you're already getting. If you're not eating healthy, then maybe you're not meeting the guidelines and you do need that supplementation. Um, but I would encourage you to try to get those things from their natural sources. Because as we know, the bioavailability is going to be significantly higher with a natural source.